Welcome back to another episode of Real Talk, everybody. I thought with everything going on in the news and the fact that I had previously planned this video to come out before, well, everything, I thought that it might be a nice respite from all of the news and everyone doom-scrolling on their phones right now. And instead of talking about the potential horrors that we see on our timeline, we could at least talk about the horror that we all kind of enjoy these days. As I had mentioned in my video last October around Halloween, I had mentioned that one of my favorite genres of media right now that I had been consuming, and I still do to this day, has been the genre of analog horror. Whether it's, you know, emergency alert broadcast scenarios, or even more recently, how it's blown up throughout the years, CHSS, or Gemini Home Entertainment, Local 58, the Mandela Catalog, it's blown up quite a bit in popularity. Almost everyone these days has their own take, their own spin, their own version, their own series, and needless to say, it's been quite the delight to consume. And what I enjoy the most about it, I think, is not just the unsettling aspects of it, but also because it's not the usual paint-by-the-numbers kind of horror films and scripts that we see nowadays. The best things, of course, in entertainment aren't going to be coming from the lifeblood of our former golden age of entertainment. It's not going to come from Hollywood. I don't think it's going to come from Broadway either, which tells us of our cultural decadence, but at the same time, it is nice to know that from the ashes, there are artists and others that are coming up with these brilliant ideas, and they don't even necessarily have to be, you know, right-wing individuals. Just the simple fact of the matter that someone wants to create this beautiful work of art, which, of course, can send a shiver down one's spine or have them checking and leaving the light on for a few nights after viewing it, I think is very telling of just how popular these things have gotten, and the fact that they aren't made by any real financial backing. But for those of you who don't know what analog horror is, I guess I'll try my best to provide a definition. It's kind of playing fast and loose with the rules. Sometimes what we consider to be analog horror doesn't meet the definition by some. That tends to be the case with art. There's always some loose set of definitions. But there are really two big factors that come with it. Primarily one, that it's you in the second person. Uh, you're the victim, so to speak. You're the one viewing this horror. It's about what you are witnessing or listening to or coming across. And, of course, the second one, true to its name, analog, using older forms of technology, not necessarily digital, but, of course, analog. Radio, old public access television stations, airwaves, old animation, all being used to tell an elaborate story about what on earth just might be out there and the otherworldly horrors therein. And, of course, you probably know some of the classics. I've talked about them before on this channel, and I already just mentioned them, too. Like Local 58, talking about a local, old-timey West Virginian public broadcast station. CHSS, about an old pharmaceutical company and the idea of radio waves and contacting otherworldly beings in this effort of psychological defense. And, of course, there are plenty others that I'll get into, most specifically the Mandela Catalog, but we'll get into that later. And as I had mentioned, it's blown up in popularity. There are seemingly new stories, new ARGs, new aspects of this genre coming up every week. The latest series of projects always blowing up with millions, if not hundreds of thousands of views, all at the same time, and everyone is craving this kind of content. And I wanted to talk about the reasons why I think it's become so popular. I think there are primarily two reasons. One is going to be that, of course, of a generational calling to older technology, and then the second one primarily being religious, and this is where I'll touch base into the Mandela catalog in just a bit. But first is the generational appeal. Of course, people these days are not going to be used to analog technology. No one is listening to their public access station. No one knows about the idea that the national anthem used to play at the end of the broadcast day. And with that being said, it's kind of interesting that so many people are interested in the stories that can be told with this older form of technology. What kind of public service announcements were there? What kind of emergency alert systems were there to warn the public? And how they may have been potentially taken advantage of by otherworldly horrors? 
you know, we think about what we would rely on in an emergency, the radio, all the TVs in case our cable is out, or the public access channel giving us the local weather alerts for a tornado watch or a warning, and what just that might be like if something were to pervert that. The most infamous one, of course, of don't look outside, or don't look at the moon or the light. Um, we had seen this in Local 58 to a terrifying degree, I think. A well-known classic horror story and, you know, open fiction trope for others to write about, but the use of television and its warnings and announcements and other beings trying to tell you what the real way to warn yourself and prepare for it, I can see why there's a generational appeal. We're all in front of our screens, we all kind of know what's coming, we can point out a deep fake. we can point out when something's been altered or shopped, but at a time so long ago, it feels like for many of us, my age and younger, you can see the appeal of how it would feel very strange or how much effort it would take to manipulate media back then. And of course we know that altered photos or doctored works were quite common, but not to the degree that it could potentially scare someone. I mean, the radio itself throughout human history, although recent, had such a great horrifying impact, the most famous story of all being the live radio broadcast of the reading of H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds with Orson Welles. I mean, if that can scare the hell out of somebody, imagine what it could have been done for public access or the radio or fireside chats, all these sorts of things that the communities had relied on. It was a time before everyone had their own little niche in the world of the internet and digital sort of kingdoms and vassal states appearing out of nowhere in the world wide web for all of us to find our own unique little communities. Back then, it was very limited in option, very limited in choice, and if something was wrong, well, it gives a great medium, I think, for storytelling for younger people. Now, I know that there are kinds of horror that are being told on a digital platform and media. Apparently, there are even types of horror on TikTok, but of course, it's not a platform for me. Yet, with all that in mind, I just think that it really appeals to younger people. What about these old stories from the 1980s, the 1970s, and 60s, and 50s? What was that message being cryptically said on the radio, and what would happen at night if I didn't follow its instructions? But outside, I think, of that generational appeal, wanting to know of the times and the technologies beforehand, not to mention it just being a very creative medium, I think the second aspect of it also has to do with a religious sense. Now, Lovecraftian horror is never going to go away, and I think he's the greatest American influence on the idea of horror in itself. But think about how many people these days are particularly secular. And I think this is where I'm going to start bringing in the Mandela Catalog. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, I really recommend that you watch the whole series and what's been made so far. I find it to be absolutely unsettling, not just for the uncanny valley aspect of these so-called intruders or alternates, but also because of how the series starts. And there are those that say that it's not particularly horrifying, but if you are of the religious type, well, then you can probably understand where I'm coming from. The series literally opens up with the story of the nativity being corrupted, allegedly these alternates or some sort of demonic influence replacing the birth of Christ with something else. The first video ending with what is apparently supposed to be Jesus himself trapped and unable to save them. And it's absolutely terrifying, I think, once you watch the rest of the series, realizing that these demonic entities have not only kidnapped and killed probably thousands of children, but we still have no idea really what they are, and the authorities kind of have an idea, and they even warn them that religious symbology, ritual, and practice isn't going to save you. And it opens up this really unique question about just what kind of world are we living in? Is it a world where evil has already won, and we're just beginning to realize it? Or, better yet, is there something that we can do about it and fight back, but we're too powerless to save ourselves because we rely on a higher power to do so? Now, of course, this is on top of the fact that the imagery, of course, hits that uncanny valley thing. One of my favorite sort of posts out there that's ever been made is this discussion about why we always get that 
sense of disgust or unease when it comes to the uncanny valley. Now, of course, we know historically that ancient humans would, of course, intermingle, so to speak, with other species within, you know, the Homo, you know, family. And I kind of find that interesting that we have, you know, Denovsian and Neanderthal DNA within ourselves, even to this day in 2022. Yet, if that wasn't the reason why we became so uneasy, what was it for? And for those of you who are religiously inclined, then the otherworldly, the supernatural, the demon, Satan. And I think that's partially why, out of every sort of series that I've consumed or bits of horror that I have enjoyed, well, that one takes the cake for the most obvious reason. A delightful different viewpoint of radio and media and public service announcements trying to come to terms of how to respond and deal with a demonic entity. And if truly the religions that we all believe in have been corrupted, well, then perhaps the advice given about what to deal with these alternates and your inevitable end, well, you can see why that would be so terrifying, not to mention the various images and distorted voices that come with said alternates and intruders. But I won't say much more else other than that. It's me exuding the praises that I can give to it. You really should watch it yourself. And I think the reason why I say it's religious is because I think for so many there is this God-shaped hole in people, as Pascal would say. I think that individuals now are turning mainly to religion as some sort of refuge. Uh, we joke about the return meme, but at the end of it all, when we recognize that there are potential horrors beyond our understanding whether Lovecraftian or our own, you know, religious nature, whether you are, you know, into Judaism, Christianity, Islam, or even other forms of religion and ancient pagan traditions, we all want to return to what we knew to have this metaphysical and theological understanding of the world, or at least many on the right do. I know that there are some on the right that consider themselves agnostic or atheist, but I think too many of us are coming back to the fact we lost something some time ago in the West. And I think that's why this brand of horror at the same time is so popular. Not just the Mandela catalog, but in general about otherworldly or supernatural forces at play that can very much have an impact on how we view ourselves. Things from outside our galaxy, or better yet, from inside our own Earth and soul, then... Maybe when all of that's put together, we can realize that by abandoning our religion, abandoning our faith, something truly, truly went wrong. But I think that I'll wrap it up there, at least for the two points that I had in mind. I do think that the religiosity of it does have a bigger role to play than just the generational appeal of the technology and the medium for storytelling. And... The reason why I focused on that so much is because we look at this world around us and we clearly know that there is evil. And when we are trying to think about the things that scare us the most, well, reality is oftentimes a pretty good representation of a way to inspire us for these horror tales. You know, I think of Frankenstein, a modern Prometheus, a story that had been passed down from ancient Greece, and now we're telling stories of demons and areas regarding Gordanrung, or the subversion of religion itself, the idea that evil had won. And what a better and more horrifying way to look at the world than just that. Because if evil has truly won, well, what a better way than for us to explore that possibility than with our own creation? Because if we look at the world around us, it may feel like that. But as we come back to these things, come back to our faiths, come back to our gods, and most importantly for many of us on the right, coming back to Christ, we kind of realize that these horrors are there for a reason, and our abandonment of old ways was definitely the catalyst for what brought them, and a catalyst for our own creations, our own artistry, and as entertaining as they may be, I do think that they are a very solemn reminder of what we've done and what we've unleashed. But these are just some of my thoughts.
I'll see you all in the comments. Most importantly, I'll see you all in the next video. Take care, everybody, and be prudent.